Okay. A um, couple of things. One is that uh, we're going to have exam next Tuesday. Okay. Um, the exam is going to be in the evening, and um, uh, you're, uh, we're going to uh, to. I think it's going to be two uh, one of the classrooms on the first floor, and I will post the room and all that. It's uh, pretty much arranged. And um, for the Chicago students, uh, the Chicago Illini Center uh, you know, uh, people will be arranged for a session where all the students can take the exam. So it will be roughly the same time, and we're going to have a TA on call to answer the Chicago questions. And uh, we were going to also uh, post any corrections uh, from the uh, from Urbana to uh, Chicago on a real time basis. Okay, so um, you know it will be a little bit logistics, and this is the first time we do this, so we'll uh, you know work out all the bugs as we go, and uh, hopefully it will work out uh, well. Um, the exam is going to cover everything up to the lecture today, okay, and um, uh, so uh, don't you know don't feel that uh, you 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 know since it's only covering the uh, uh, lecture up to today, um, you know you should still come to the Thursday lecture. Okay, the Thursday lecture will be important for your uh, project. So, uh, do, do you see that uh, we're not having an MP due this week, right? And the reason why is that we want to make sure that you have enough time to study for the exam and so on. So we're trying to even out the workload. So don't just take a, take your time off. Okay, this is this course is really designed for you to have a very steady workflow and uh, work, workload through the semester. So uh, don't let things accumulate, okay? Just keep up, and you know what? Well, it should be very reasonable. We, we feel that this, exam, uh, this course shouldn't take more than five hours or so outside the, uh, the, uh, the classroom. And uh, if, you take, if you feel that you only take, uh, you know, spending 20 minutes outside the lecture every week, on this course, there's something wrong. Okay, so you know what? You really should be spending, you know, a minimum of three hours and probably up to five hours a week. You know, uh, working on the code and you know, studying the uh, book chapter and uh, you know, uh, reviewing the lecture and so on. Um, some of some of our previous students told me at at the beginning of the semester. Um, they feel that oh, the course is you know fairly easy, and uh, every lecture seems to be pretty easy to understand. But these things build up. Okay, there's a reason why we build up the material this way. So you know, don't get yourself behind at the beginning of the semester, because in the end, it will be very very hard to catch up. You know, if you build up too much of the uh, deficiency. Okay. So uh, last time, we talked about. You know, some of the basics of machine learning, right? We talk about learning a truth table, right? That, that's actually the, the real foundation of machine learning. And um, uh, I also uh, told you multiple times that this is not a machine learning class, okay? So don't treat this as a machine learning class. You, you, if you're interested in machine learning, you should still take a machine learning class where some of the statistical considerations and so on are you know, really, really not the focus of this course. On the other hand, even if you took a machine learning class, oftentimes the machine learning classes don't treat the computational aspect, the programming aspect of um, you know training and uh, inference, um, you know, uh, to the uh, to the level that a computer engineering, computer science student really should understand. So that's the part that we're trying to convey in this part, so that. Uh, you know, by the end of this lecture series, you should be able to, you know, write a piece of code, you know, just like that to do it, to train a model or to, you know, to be able to do the inference. And when you use the frameworks such as TensorFlow, such as MXNet, you should be very, very confident about, uh, you know, what you're doing, and because you, 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 you will understand the computational aspect of all these frameworks and uh, models. So uh, let's go back just. Uh, review this just a little bit. We talk about classification, and classification is only one facet of machine learning techniques. Okay, we have all these other, you know, the, uh, use cases such as translation, such as you know what the uh, you know uh, prediction and so on. 
uh, regression. So uh, you know, don't think that this is the only machine learning <laughs> okay, technique. On the other hand, since we're going to go deeper into the, uh, the computation, we're going to use classification. Classification is actually really good because classification is a foundational uh, use case. If you know how to classify things, then you have a really good foundation of determining what to do with uh, you know, all the input, right? You have to first figure out what the inputs are before you can actually uh, do some transformations on the input. So that's why, um, you know, if you look at the Google, uh, Facebook, and so on, they all spend a huge amount of the, the effort trying to get classification to work you know, uh, accurately for, for their ap applications. So uh, in the end, uh, classification is a very simple problem. The problem is that uh, uh, you want to be able to, you know, to map from an input, from an input with very high dimension of uh, freedom. So this is R. Each uh, R is a real number. And R to the M meaning that uh, you have N of these numbers in your input. So you have N degree of freedom, right? And uh, so you map from that R, uh, you know, N of these R number, uh, real numbers, into one of the class, you know, classes. So you determine for each input uh, n real numbers, which class, you know, uh, uh, which uh, category or which class this input belongs, right? So that's the classification problem. And uh, um, what we uh, formulate as a computational problem is that we define a function, okay? We define a function that will take the input, which is x, take the input, and then the, the system that we build has all these internal uh, weights and uh, parameters, right? So these weights and parameters are equivalent to the end gates and OR gates that we have in a logical system. So that uh, we take that design and we take the input. So this whole thing would form a function. And you crank on it and you get an output. The output is Y, which tells you which of the categories, right? the input belongs. So theta, in this case, really can cap, ca encapsulate the structure and weights of our network. So I'm going to go into the sort of the, a sequence of uh, derivation just to make sure that you really understand neural net. Because neural net did not come into being you know, on its own. It's actually evolution of several generations of linear networks, and, uh, uh, you, uh, and plus some nonlinearity uh, in the network to be able to, you know, the, to do these predictions and classifications. So let's start with linear classification, okay, linear classifiers. And uh, sometimes we, you know, with, uh, in statistics we say it's a linear regression. You know, what, uh, let's figure out how to fit a data to a line or how to draw a line to classify, right, to classify. Whenever you are on one side of the line, you're in one category, whenever you are on the other side of the line, you have another category. So this is you know, what, a simple uh, by, you know, uh, uh, sort of a, uh, uh, by classification or a classification that uh, classifies data into two, one of the two categories. And um, you know, if you need to classify more categories, all you have to do is you need to uh, figure out, draw more lines and you know, how you can uh, you know, classify into more categories. So, um, you know what, the, what we can do in this case, if, if we know that we can draw a line, a line is fairly simple, right? A line is y equal to uh, ax plus b, right? That's a line. And the trick is to figure out what the coefficient a is, what coefficient b is, right? So that you can draw that line. And so, um, you know, um, what we, we're going to do is we're going to actually try to figure out how to determine that A and B. So in machine learning, A is going to be called W. Essentially, it's the weight that we're going to give to each input value, right? And B is going to be the bias. So B is you know, actually still called B, but it's the bias that uh, we're going to place. And, but in the end, it's still going to be Y equal to W, X times uh, plus B. And in this case, X is actually a uh, you know, vector. So uh, you know, uh, we're going to, uh, to uh, we're going, 
in a two-dimensional case, x is a single value, but um, uh, we could, in, in a, uh, you know, when we have multiple of these inputs uh, in the vector, you, we, for example, if we have a picture, the picture has all these pixels. So the pixel values will be x0, x1, x2, x3. So then we essentially will have a big vector to represent all the pixels in a picture. So uh, going back to the simple two-dimensional case, we only have one x value, and then uh, we're going to try to draw a line, and then uh, you know, to figure out whether the line is going to be, you know, the, the, the data points are going to be on the lower left or upper right of the uh, classification. So basically, uh, we, we, re we receive these data uh, points, and the, somehow someone's going to label the data points and say, oh, this should be one, this category, and this data should be that category. And so we have these colors, and then we tra train the machine learning you know, mechanism to draw that line to be able to accurately classify uh, these ca categories. So um, if, you, if we look at it, then uh, we, you know, uh, when we start to look at the uh, sort of the, the pixels and so on, then we start to have a uh, you know input which is a, a pixel, uh, each pixel value, and W is also going to be a vector of weights that we're going to multiply to each pixel value, and then uh, we're going so this becomes a inner product, right? And the inner product uh, you know gives us one number. All the multiplications and accumulate, we get one value, and then we add the bias to give us a y value, and that y value is supposed to tell us, you know, which category, uh, you know, it uh, belongs to. That's why this computation, you know, all the neural net, all these, you know, um, classifier kind of things, you will essentially see a inner product. Okay, the inner product is usually between the weights, which are the coefficients, and the input values, right? And um, neural net is a very, very typical example of, you know, such an inner product. This is the reason why we mentioned, you know, so many times that inner product is so important for engineering and, um, you know, uh, uh, science uh, applications. So, one of the tricky points is that in real world, there's no black and white, okay? Oftentimes, you know, um, we may need to, you know, to de determine, you know, if certain, you know, classification may not be a simple line that determines whether you're blue or red or, you know, sometimes they're purple, right? So there are all these kind of, you know, complexities that <coughs> we need to, uh, to be able to classify. So for example, if we have a, uh, you know, a, a, a situation where we need to classify four data points here, and what we really want to do is we want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, classify if the data points are, um, you know, sort of in the middle versus the extreme data points, right? So then, uh, you know, what this is actually, you know, uh, something that we cannot easily just draw a line and say, okay, anything on the left and anything on the right are these two categories. So now uh, we will need to draw two lines for this. And in the logic way, think, uh, way of thinking, we can think about these four values as input, um, you know, the sort of the input, uh, two input values, x0 and x1, okay? And then, uh, you know, so we have essentially a, uh, you know, both values are false, one value is true, the other value is true, and then both values are true, right? So 0, 0, um, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, right? So now, um, if we want to learn this particular logic, which is exclusive OR, remember that exclusive OR that I, I showed um, you know, last time. If we want to learn this exclusive OR, we cannot just give it a single linear function and say, okay, go learn it, because there's no single line that you can draw to, you know, to, to make this classification. So if we draw a single line, we could learn an N function, and so uh, only when both values are one, you will be in one category, and then if any of the values are zero, then you, you're in this category. Or you can use, uh, learn the OR function, um, you know, anything, uh, this value, when both are zero, you're on this side, and then any of the, uh, the values are, uh, is one, you go to go on this side, uh, part. But for exclusive OR, we don't have that uh, single 
you know, single line that we can use to determine the category. So this is the reason why we use the concept of uh, weight and then, uh, you know, uh, bias and then uh, the sigmoid function, okay? So um, we essentially we say, okay, uh, what, is, what would be a reasonable n you know, line that we can learn about the n function? So the n function, if we use a numerical way of calculating this, let's say x, you know, uh, uh, x0 and x1 can be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, right? So you know, let's say uh, you know, we have these four values. And we can define a linear function x0 plus x1 minus 1.5. We give that bias a large enough value, negative enough value, that both x0 and x1 need to be big enough to pull the value to the positive side. Otherwise, you end up with negative. Right? So this is a kind of a nice linear function that can be, uh, can be used to draw that line. And basically what we're doing is this. We're drawing a line saying x plus y, or x0, uh, x zero plus x1. This is x0, this is x1. x0 plus x1 has to be sufficiently bigger than 1. OK, bigger than 1. So we, we're drawing this 1.5 right here, 1.5. And then, um, you know, so we can safely uh, classify the three cases here and then the one case here. That line gives us enough of a margin so that all the three points are going to be safely classified this way, and then the one point on top will be safely classified the other way. Right? So this is a linear function that gives us either a positive value or a negative value depending on the two input values. So that's good. So we got the n function. We can also draw a line for the OR function. Okay, the OR function, you can think about, you know, the, the way that you can think about it is, as long as one of them is one, I should be able to pull it to positive, right? But then, if both of them are zero, then I'll let it sink to negative, right? So that the, I can classify the upper three. So intuitively, if you look at this, this, you know, the intersection here will be 0 0.5, okay? So that uh, basically uh, x0 plus x1 should be greater than 0 0.5, right? So that um, those three points here, 1, 0, 0, 1, uh, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1, will all be able to pull the function value to positive, right? They all only have to overcome 0 0.5. So the threshold is a little lower for OR, and then if both of them are zero, then you get a negative 0 0.5. So the, by playing with this, this bias, right, we, I was able to draw the line in different places to be able to uh, emulate the effect of a and versus a or. So this is kind of an analog way of calculating a piece of logic. So then if, we, if I put a kind of a, you know, a, a a sign detector and say, am I getting a negative number or am I getting a positive number? So I will be able, to, I should be able to, you know, to, to uh, detect the sign and say, okay, if, if it's negative number, I'm going to just say this logic value is zero. If it's a positive number, I will say it's a uh, you know, logic value one. Then I, I have a logical output, right, of a and and or of my uh, input data. So by learning the weights, if I have a way to learn the weights of 1 and negative 1.5, 1, 1, negative 0 0.5, if I can learn all these things, then I can actually synthesize that function, even though I didn't know that I was trying to do an N function or trying to do an OR function. The data will tell me, if I have enough label data, the data will tell me how to set these weights and how to set these biases. And we're going to see you know, that in, uh, in the uh, next few slides. So the problem is, when we try to combine these and or functions into a more complex uh, you know, uh, logic function, it actually can become very, very tricky. Because the bias that we're putting on the and and putting on the or are not exactly the same. So when we try to combine them, these things may not add up to the kind of exclusive or that we want. 
So that's why when we you know, combine these functions, we tend to first do a kind of a, uh, you know, a, a clamping and discretization first, and then we do another combination in order to you know, synthesize the appropriate complex logic function. So here, we say that the, you know, instead of you know, just giving the output uh, you know, either negative 0 or uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, positive 0 0.5 or positive you know, uh, 1.5 for end, which do a sign detection you know, for the end function. So, and then the sign function will actually give us either a negative 1 or positive 1. Okay? So it's no longer logic value, it's a negative 1 or positive 1. It's a classification value, right? So, so for the end function, if we put a sign function outside that uh, linear expression, then we get something like this. So if, you know, a, b are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, then the end, sort of the, um, the, the end function is going to give us negative 1 for the first three and positive 1 in the uh, last one. We already went through this, so, you know, it's, uh, it, there's nothing new here. And the or is going to you know, uh, have the sign here, so it's going to give us negative 1 here, okay, negative 1 here, and then positive 1 for the bottom 3. So now the question is, can we combine these two so that we can get an exclusive, a, you know, a functional exclusive or out of it, okay? So the answer is yes. What we can do is we can do a or, a linear combination, a bias, of the and or function and take another sign and we will get the correct negative one or positive one out of the whole thing. So um, we, you know, we're going to you know, need to give or a little bit stronger influence because the or output, you know, uh, the, we need to be able to, to have the or output to be able to, you know, what, uh, to pull the, the values up, right? Whenever uh, n says negative 1 or says positive 1, the or should prevail, right? The or should give out, uh, you know, the effect the output to positive 1 for the 0, 1, and 1, 0 cases. So intuitively, we, we give or a little bit more weight, 2, and then n is 1, so that in, the, in those two cases, it will be able to pull the uh, value to 1. On the other hand, um, you know what, we want to be able to, you know, to, uh, to have the output to be negative um, if, if, if those cases are going to be positive ones. Because or may be too powerful to be able to, you know, pull the, uh, the middle case. So what we want to do is we want to be able to, uh, to subtract two. So uh, we have the or and n to fight, and then we put a bias to make sure that we shift the output, you know, outcome to the right combination of negative 1, positive 1, positive 1, and negative 1. So if we, if we look at this evaluation, this is where uh, I give you, the, uh, you know, the, the expression value here. Um, the 2 times or minus and uh, minus 2 will give us negative 3, positive 1, positive 1, and negative 1. And if we take the sine function, we get the negative 1, positive 1, positive 1, and negative 1. So this gives us the right positive or negative value for the exclusive or function. And they say, oh, you know, you can, you can think about this, you know, for exclusive or, okay? Of course, you know, what, it's, it's a simple enough function. You can play with the numbers, and then the human can actually design that, right? But <clears throat> when you start to have more complex functions, it becomes a very tedious and very difficult problem. In fact, in some cases, we don't even know what it's the real function that we're trying to get. You know, so what we do is what? We use the data to, you know, to shape the, you know, all these uh, values. We we'll use the data to share all the weights and the biases, all the weights and biases, so that, that it will give us, in the end, for most of the data, we're going to get the correct answer. Right? So that's really the foundation of regression, okay, of classification. And uh, it's a statistical approach. And uh, we want to be able to, you know, to gradually adapt all these coefficients in the system according to the data, right? According to the data, so that uh, we can get the correct function. Any questions before we go into the real implementation of these kind of things? Okay. So is it 
clear that you know, we want to do some classification, and we're going to take the input values, and we're going to use some kind of you know, linear function to be able to generate positive value, uh, your positive value or negative value. But when we use linear function, if we go through too many stages, these biases can actually accumulate and then so on. So every so often, we do a sine function just to pull everything into, back into either positive one or negative one so that things don't go out of whack, right? And then uh, we, we do another round on positive, negative, and we pull them back to positive one, negative one. So we can accumulate a large number of stages of these things and still have reasonable values so we don't end up with a, like a runaway number you know, uh, in the accumulation of our systems, okay? So this is what we call the OR and AND perceptron. Each of these you know, um, input multiplied by something, add by something, and then uh, assign each of these little functions Linear combination, bias, and sign is called a little perceptron. Okay, this is historical. And, uh, you know, it's mostly used for, you know, computer vision. And then, so we have another little perceptron in the end that will take the output of the previous two perceptrons and then do the next linear function, right? So this is a very, uh, you know, very, um, uh, I would say, composable system. Right, you have these little perceptron components, right, and then you can acute, you can kind of attach them with each other. You can run in parallel with each other to build a system that will do the classification for you. Okay, now, so what I told you was a way to take two input values, right, two input values so far, and generate one output bit. Positive one or negative one, right? And you know, so you the uh, kind of a binary output. So we can have multiple inputs. We can have x one, x two, x x zero, one two, or even x a thousand and twenty four, x one million, right? So we can have a huge number of inputs on the left hand side, right? So that's why. You know, in the end, we're going to have a inner product formulation for the input vectors, right? So all of those coefficients will be formulated as Ws, the W vector, right? The W vector for each input value. They may or may not be the same for each input, right? In general, they actually shouldn't be the same. The example just happened to, to be the same for the N function and the OR function. But as soon as we get to the combination of the n and or, remember, we had 1 and negative 2 immediately for the coefficient. So these weights are actually vectors, okay, vectors that are proportional to the input size. Make sense? Okay. And the output that we gave you, you know, so far is only 1y. But for a complex output system, you're going to have you know, uh, the multiple bits, right? Uh, you know, multiple output bits, so that those are going to be y0, y1, y2, y3, y4. One simple example is that, let's say, if we're going to classify things into 1,024 categories rather than two categories, in order for me to tell which category the input belongs to a thousand, in a 1,024 classification system, what we're going to need is a 10-bit number, right? 10-bit number that tells me which category it is. And those 10 bits will be y0 to y9 here, okay? So I need to be able to generate those 10-bit numbers in order to give me a, you know, a real classification of a large number of classes, pedestrians, road, you know, the speed bumps, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, cats, squirrels, and so on, right? So the, the, how do I classify all these things? You know, certain things you can run over, certain things you shouldn't run over, right? So, you know, there are many, many of these classes. Uh, classes. So when you have a bigger classification, you know, uh, kind of category, you need to be able to generate a lot more of those white bits. So now we have a situation. We, have, we can have a very large number of these X, okay, X elements because these are the number of inputs that we have. And we can have a very large number, or reasonably large number of Y output 
right? The y uh, vector, y elements. So you can imagine that for each output y, for each output y here, we're going to have x0 through x2 here. Each one will have a multiply add, multiple i, multiple i. So this, this particular category from all the inputs to one of the output is a perceptron. That is a perceptron. It has the coefficients, it has the bias, right? So this is one of the perceptrons. And then all these inputs to y1 will be another perceptron, right? So we're going to have all, essentially we define all these perceptrons to be able to generate y2, y3, y4, and every y value can be influenced by every x value through those weights, right? And the weights that we're going to use to calculate from w0, uh, x0 to x2 for, gen, for that y0 value will be different, will be different than the weights that we use to calculate y1, right? So now you can see that this system is going to have a fairly large number of weights. The number of weights is going to be the number of inputs times the number of outputs, right? So we will need to have five output, three input, we're going to need to have 15 weights, weight coefficients. And all these coefficients will need to be learned, okay, in the you know, a, a training process to be able to, you know, to fully define the system, okay? And this is the reason why we call it a fully connected uh, you know, uh, uh, network because every input is able to affect every output, okay, every output, and so it's a matter of determining the weights that, uh, you know, that was give you the different levels of input, uh, influence from the input to the output, right? So um, basically, if you think about it, every input, so we're going to have a uh, inner product, right, inner product for every, uh, inner product for uh, all the inputs and the one way to generate one output, right? So basically the way to think about it is now you have a whole series of inner products, the in, whole series of inner products. And the x0, x1, x2 is one input vector. And then you need to have a whole bunch of these inner products to be able to generate the output vector. And all those inner products to get, can be collected into a matrix. Okay, the matrix is going to be the output, uh, you know, the number of outputs times the number of inputs. And that matrix is the uh, fully connected matrix. And it's a matrix vector multiplication in order to generate the output vector. Okay, so we're not quite in the matrix matrix multiplication yet. In order to produce a output, you know, just a vector of input and uh, from into the vector of output, we're going to take the vector of input and uh, multiply it by a input dimension times output dimension matrix of weights. And we're going to learn that matrix. Essentially, that's what it is. Okay, we're going to learn that matrix and the biases, right? We also need to learn the biases in order to be able to, you know, to fully produce a uh, perceptron. So, turns out that the, some of these functions are way too complicated to implement using only one layer, okay? Only one matrix. Sometimes you need to have multiple layers, essentially function after function after function. This is essentially the com composability of your system. It, it may be too complicated to try to train you know, uh, a function to do a complex, so you, you, you de de decompose that complex function into multiple stages, and each stage does some amount of work working towards uh, the final outcome. So we have x0, x1, x2, x3 here. So input vector comes in. And then we have what we call the input layer. So the input layer is no, you know, no, no more than just a, what, perceptron layer, right? So, so we have these you know, weight matrices. 
that are, you know, essentially is the way between the i's input and the j's output. So uh, we already talked about that. And then you have another layer that will take the output of your, uh, you know, of your previous layer and do the perceptron thing again. Okay, do the perceptron thing. Remember that X war, right? So we synthesize X war with the, you know, the input that generated the N function, the out function, uh, the OR function, right? And then we took those two outputs and we generate, we use a, another layer to do the perceptron to be able to synthesize the exclusive OR function, right? And then uh, we could have, you know, more things in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, the more layers after that, and then we eventually have an output layer that will take the semi-final output, right, and use another layer of perceptron to generate the real output value. So, you know, you can imagine if we need to synthesize much more complex functions, we can use the N or not exclusive or, and then we can synthesize some, you know, fairly complex adder, for example, we can actually synthesize an adder, a can multiplier, we can synthesize, you know, some kind of a cosine function, okay, even, we can learn the cosine function with these kind of things, you know, because these are just logic design. We're just synthesizing the output bits of the cosine function, right? So these things are, can, can all be synthesized with these layers and layers of complexity, essentially we're building up a kind of a big logic gate system, okay? to be able to, you know, to do whatever functionality we want. So this would be the multi-layer perception uh, network. And um, uh, sometimes, you know what, uh, you need to uh, do a kind of a uh, final uh, data out outcome to be able to, you know, generate the probability. Essentially, um, you know, you're going to uh, generate, in this case, for the classification, a lot of times we don't generate just one number and say, okay, this is class, you know, the, this is category 17. What we do is we actually will generate 1,024 probabilities, okay? And then we pick the, the, the highest probability entry. So, in fact, if you go to a lot of these Facebook and, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft CNTK kind of sites, and then uh, you upload a, a picture and say, okay, uh, you know, tell me uh, what this picture is. The answer is oftentimes not just Eiffel Tower, okay? The answer is going to be the top five or top ten things that this thing could be. And then it will give you a probability according to the classifier that the Facebook or Microsoft implemented in the back, okay? So, so this, these K0, K1, K2 in a classification system tend to be the probability of, you know, for that particular input to be in that category. And then you pick the maximal uh, value out of among them, okay? So, so now let's go into the, um, you know, sort of the, the more, um, the real essence of how we're going to determine these weights, right? In the end, these weights are the most important part, and the biases, right? Are the parts that define the logic that uh, you can implement. So let's say if we have a fully connected layer with 784 inputs and um, 1,024 outputs, okay? So, you know, we have a small picture, okay? Small picture that has 784 pixels, right? So we have, you know, 784 inputs, so those are the pixels. And then now uh, we have 1,024 outputs, essentially 1,024 uh, class, you know, uh, cl classes of uh, 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 possibilities. The weight matrix is going to be 784 times 1,024. Okay, so this is a non-trivial amount of data. Okay, so you know we need to keep that in mind. These weights can actually grow very fast. In order for us to be able to handle real-world situation, we're going to have probably a lot more categories of real-world objects we need to classify, and we have probably higher, uh, you know, higher, um, you know, uh, uh, resolution of pictures that we need to be able to process. So uh, I don't know how many of you went to Tanvir's seminar from IBM. And, uh, you know, Tanvir is an IBM fellow who's uh, leading the cancer grand challenge at IBM uh, using machine learning techniques. And uh, she gave a, a distinguished uh, lecture at the uh, ECE uh, last, I think, last fall. 
And uh, one of the things I should, you know, should, should mention during the talk, I don't know how many people caught that, is that when you, know, when you try to you know, uh, make a cancer diagnosis based on uh, medical imaging, um, the resolution needs to be high so that uh, they can have high, you know, high resolution to be able to tell the cancer you know, cells from the, uh, you know, from the uh, regular cells. And then she mumbled something about the number of ways in these things may, uh, don't usually even, uh, they don't even fit into the main memory of most of the systems. And that is actually all come from this thing. Because you, 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 you can imagine that uh, we have something like uh, you know, a 2K by 2K picture, right? And the 2K by 2K uh, medical imaging picture is very, very, uh, you know, uh, from X-ray and so on. It's actually, you know, the, uh, what people use to be able to you know, really diagnose these things. And that's for, um, you know, megapixels. And then you have all kinds of, you know, uh, situations. It's not just cancer, no cancer. You, you need to give the doctor, you know, a, a fairly large number of these categories so that the doctors can actually look at these outcomes and say, okay, this makes sense or not. If it's just a simple value, uh, you know, answer, the doctors say, okay, you say yes, but why did you say yes? Right? So, so there's actually a large number of outputs uh, of probabilities of each type of you know, the situation. So that's why you, you start to have these millions of input, right? And then you have these, you know, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of output, you know, probabilities, and that combination gives you a very large weight matrix because it's the number of inputs times the number of outputs, right? It's a very simple thing as long as you understand the fundamental design of these systems, and then it will make perfect sense when you, you know, talk to uh, these people. So we want to be able to look use the observational data to d determine the weights, okay? So we want to be able to have a large number of these, you know, input images, right? Input images, and the input image will be labeled saying, okay, you know, someone is going to be labeled that input image to be a person, you know, a squirrel, you know, and rabbit, and, you know, whatever, and uh, rope, you know, uh, uh, speed bumps, and so on. So with enough input data, and sort of the labeled corresponding outputs, we can model the relationship between inputs and outputs and determine all the big weight values. Okay, so that's the training. So this brings us to the important, uh, you know, two important words uh, for the you know, rest you know, of the, uh, the ser uh, series. The first one is forward, uh, which is inference, the forward propagation, and then uh, the second one is the backward propagation, which is the training path. The forward uh, path essentially uh, says, given the parameters, given all the weights and biases we already trained, when you have a new input, when you have a new input, what output does, do you get? Okay, so you need to go through all those inner product vector, matrix vector multiplication and so on to be able to get the output probabilities, right? And then you pick one, which is the, so that's the inference. Backward propagation is the training part. So given the input data, okay, given some input data set and the labels, okay, and the labels that, uh, that humans give you or somehow, you know, some, somehow generated, um, you need to be able to determine what would be a good theta value setting, right? The set, the values for all the weights and biases so that you can do well. You can do well matching your, your uh, classification with the correct answer, with the labeled answer. So that's the training part, okay? So we're actually going to go through both. And the, uh, usually the backward part is built on the forward part, okay? So here is a, you know, uh, here is the network that, um, you know, we talked about. You know, so you, uh, we already talked about the exclusive OR, so you can think about this as input, you know, those two values, okay, two values go into a, um, you know, let's say a N function and the OR function, so we're going to get a N output and OR output, right? So we can have, you know, two input bits 
going into these two parts, and then each one gives us an in end and out. Uh, it's sort of the end linear output and the or linear output. And then we do a sine function here to determine a, a uh, uh, output of n logic and output of or out logic, right? And then we, you remember, we feed that into a second stage. So the second stage per perceptron is now going to multiply that one with the, uh, you know, the, the or uh, and, so, uh, actually, uh, uh, and then two, the two with the or and one with and, and then, uh, you know, we're going to uh, add a bias and uh, do the sign function to determine the final exclusive or, right? So now we have a generalized uh, picture, bunch of inputs, right? And then, uh, you know, uh, with all these perceptrons, we have an all connection. We have an all connected layer here that generates the first stage of linear output. We use the sigmoid functions. The sigmoid function is actually just a smooth sine function. Okay, the sine function goes like, right? But the sigmoid function goes like this. And the reason why we use sigmoid function is because remember, um, we're going to be doing, uh, you know. Essentially, we're going to make some, some you know, adjustments. And the adjustments require us to use derivatives. And the sine function has a nasty, nasty property that the, the derivative at zero is infinity, right? So you don't want to have that kind of you know, numerical property in your, derivative, you know, in your uh, computing ca ca calculation. So we just make it into a kind of a somewhat smooth function with a you know, fairly nice uh, derivative function, which is kind of a linear function you know, uh, near the zero, but very steep, but still a linear function that is you know, so that things are under control. Okay? We don't have a numerical value explosion. So really, conceptually, sigmoid is really a sign. Okay? It's really a sign function with smoother, a little bit you know, nicer, uh, you know, um, uh, numerical uh, properties when we do the derivatives. So this is, in many ways, the difference between ice dancing and ice skating competition. Does that make sense? How many of you have been watching the uh, Winter Olympics? One? Oh, come on. Okay. You have to go back to, uh, okay. Uh, so the, let me add, to an, uh, add another homework. Uh, you know, this, this is really homework for your own good. Um, you need to go back to the um, YouTube and watch the long program competition of the ice dancing uh, that was aired yesterday. And you know, there's several teams that essentially made history yesterday. You know, they were they were doing things that were not done before. Okay. In, in, in that kind of competition. But that's not what uh, the point I'm making here. The point I'm making here is that ice dancing is a sigmoid function. And ice skating is a sine function. Why? Because ice skating requires these people to be able to click on the ice and do the turns. Okay? So it's a discontinuous, abrupt function that they jump in the air and they do the spin. Okay? So that's, the derivative of that thing is infinity, okay? There's no question about that. But ice dancing is a smooth you know, movement, okay? They do all kinds of these things, you know, all kinds of movements in a smooth, continuous way, okay? And so, you know, those are the pictures I want you to remember about sine and sigmoid, okay? And, um, hey. We're engineers, okay? We need to have intuition, okay? And what makes you, going to make you fantastic engineers compared to some of these other, you know, schools that consider themselves as our peers, uh, such as some small schools on the East Coast and small schools on the West Coast, is that our engineers should come out with great intuitions, okay? And, you know, those people may not, you know, will, will probably never understand uh, some of the sigmoid versus sign, okay? So, um, then let, let's do the forward propagation. The forward propagation is very simple. Okay? It's essentially what I just told you. You know, we do the weight, we multiply the weights to the input values, right? And um, so all the inputs collectively is vector, x vector, and all the uh, weight collectively is the w vector, and we do an inner product. So that's the inner product, and then we plus the 
bias vector. B is the bias vector now, right? And then we do a sigmoid of the FC1, and then we get uh, you know, the S1 output. So this is the S1 output. And then we take the, you know, then this S1 is a vector as well, right? Even in a simple example, it will be the N and OR output. Okay, make sure that you're grounded. Okay, you're always grounded with intuition when we look at these expressions. One of the biggest problems that many many engineers have is that they don't ground their you know their reading of these expressions and you know vector notations and so on with intuition and you know, get lost very quickly. And you know, once you're grounded with some simple examples, your intuition will always be right. Okay, so the the second layer is you know, we take the output, the, uh, the output elements or the output vector S1 and we do another inner product with the, the weights in that layer and then add the bias so we form that linear function output C2 and then we do the sigmoid to generate the regulated output values All right. for the second layer. Okay. And then uh, you know, we do the argument max to, to generate the probability. Remember the probability that we generate, and then we pick the highest probability, and we say, OK, that's the category. So that's the four pass. So for every picture, we're going to generate all these probabilities. And then, um, so how do we do training? This is going to be very, very important. Okay? And you should go to the textbook and read uh, textbook chapter, I think, 16. And uh, we give you a lot more detail about uh, about you know this der the derivation. But here is the intuition. The intuition is, if you do the forward pass, if you do the forward pass, you're going to get a probability distribution, right? So you know what the hopefully the you know uh, the uh, the category that you're trying to do, you know to to generate has the highest probability, and then all the other categories will have lowest prob lower probability for that particular input, right? If you get a human picture in, into this type pipeline, the human category should be very high, and then the squirrels and the, you know, the monkeys and so on should be somewhat low, right? And on the other hand, uh, when, when you provide the label data, the label data will tell you, let's say this is human. So you can translate that into the probability of all zeros for every other probability category and one for the human, right? So that's the labeled probability. Does that make sense, right? The, so the label gives you the correct answer. So you, you have, ideally, you want to have a one probability for that particular category and zero for everything else. But then with all the weights and so on, when you process that input, you're going to get some kind of probability. Hopefully, the one category that you're trying to, to, to get has the highest probability, right? Hopefully 0 0.9 or something, and then everything else should be small. So you can take that, you can take that probability distribution and calculate the difference between that distribution and the ideal distribution, right? That gives you the, the error, okay? So that gives you the error of every output bit, right? Every output, every output bit. So that's the error. That's called e here. And what we want to do in this process is to adjust the weight so that we can minimize that error. So that for every input, we're going to get as close to the ideal one and zero everything else as possible, right? So so this gives us this particular one here. We, you know, we want to be able to, uh, to, to ask, how do, we gen, uh, you know, how do we adjust the weight, okay, the weight of this, you know, of these, and the bias in this uh, layer so that the error can be minimized, okay, so that the uh, error can, can, can be minimized. And so when we look at the error, we see that the error is going to be, you know, uh, the, the very last thing that we're going to have is we're going to pick the, the category with the highest probability. So the y is going to be the probability, and then we have a final outcome, which is human or, you know, something else. So we say, as far as I can tell, at the very last stage, my 
incoming y is going to determine my outgoing answer, right? So I can calculate how fast the answer, the error, and then I can calculate an error, right, for my outcome. So I can say, what is, as a function of y, how fast is my e ch uh, error changing? So if I vary my y, I'm going to, you know, it's a function, right? So, you know, if, uh, given any y, I'm going to have an e, right? So if, with that function, how fast is the error going to change when I change y? So this is the partial derivative of e over y. And at the very last stage, all you got is y. Okay, you, you don't see anything in front of it. You only see y that, that you know, what, uh, the output, and then you're, you're going to you know, be able to calculate some error. So you can calculate d, e, d, y, you know, so that uh, you can, you know, essentially see how quickly should I change y, you know, that which direction should I change y. If y increases, is my error going to decrease? Right? If I change y in this direction, is e going to increase or decrease? So you, you can kind of play with it to be able to minimize e by playing with y. Right? Okay, so that's d, d, uh, d e d y. Now, when I, so I, I can do the calculation and then say, okay, I know the d e d y. And then I go to this section and say, uh, you know, as far as the s is concerned, okay, so now, you know, and, and I know that, uh, you know, y is based on s too, so when I come to this layer, I can ask, how fast is the error going to change, you know, how fast the error is going to change if I change my s, s2, okay? S2 feeds into y, right? S2 feeds into y. I already know how fast E is going to change based on y, okay? When I go backwards. So now that I have the d, e, d, y function, I can actually calculate, you know, d, s, d, y by doing the chain rule because chain rule says d, e, d, s2 is really d, D E D Y times D Y D S two. This is just the regular chain rule for, for your calculus. There's a reason why they teach chain rule in calculus. Okay, the single most important usage of chain rule for engineers is actually this. Okay, the derivation of error changing rate based on the input changing rate. And you have multiple stages in your system. You need to use the, 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 you know, the chain rule to be able to calculate the effect of earlier stage output on the error that you have in the uh, final output. So that's exactly why we learn, you know, in my mind, that's the most important reason why we learn chain rule as engineers. Now, so based on d, e, d, y, if I can calculate dy ds2, okay, D, dy ds2, then I can calculate uh, de ds2, okay, de ds2. So I'm going to show you with example how we do that calculation. And once you understand this, you can say, okay, let's go back to this level. And here, you know what, well, we're going to have fc2 as the output. And so I want to be able to tell how fast is that final error going to change based on anything I change to the fc2 function, right? So and I can use the chain rule again and say, okay, um, you know, I don't know exactly what it is, but this is actually based on you know, ds2 de, uh, de ds2 and then ds2 dcf. So I already calculated my d, e, d, s, 2 in my previous stage. So I already have that available. And if I can calculate this part in, during this stage, and this is just the input and output relationship of this particular stage, then I can uh, go to the next stage. So this is almost like a crime investigation. You catch someone at the crime and say, OK, I call this person. And then you interrogate the person and say, okay, who's your boss, okay? What, uh, who told you to do this? And the person say, can you give me 
two years less sentence if I tell you. I said, yeah, okay. So then you go and find the boss. You go and arrest the boss, you interrogate, and say, okay, tell me who is your boss, but who told, told you to do this? Oh, if you give me three years of sentence, you know, sentence alleviation, uh, uh, you know, the alleviate, uh, three years of sentence, I'll tell you. And then you go to the next level, right? So this is the chain of investigation, and essentially, it will go to the very top and say, okay, the, for the first layer, you know, if I change any of my layer design, my function, how would I change the final error? Why? Because in the end, the objective is to make sure that the error is as close to zero as possible, right? So we adjust the, the weight so that uh, in the end, we'll have, you know, uh, as small possible as error as like, we can. So now let's look at a example here. The example is, um, you know, let's say we have this, you know, uh, uh, labeled image, and um, uh, so we have a, uh, you know, let's say 60,000 grayscale images of handwritten data, okay? And uh, let's say each image is 28 by 28 grayscale. So the, you take these very, you know, uh, single letter, uh, you know, handwritten, uh, you know, uh, uh, letter, and you take a little picture, uh, 28 pixel by 28 pixel, and then you give the image to a classifier, right, to a classifier, and then say, okay, which letter is this? You know, is this A, B, C, D, and so on? Or one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, the, it depends on your, your, your purpose, right? So, we, let's say we collected 60,000 of these handwriting uh, images, and then we're going to uh, try to train a, a network to be able to do the classification, to be able to you know, tell which letter or which number um, you know, that you wrote. So uh, we can use perceptron, okay? We can use perceptron, and then uh, we can just say, um, you know, the x are pixels. So we have 28 times 28, right? Uh, so that's about, uh, you know, at, uh, uh, somewhere around 700 something uh, pixels, or eight, you know, maybe 800 or so pixels. And then, uh, so the, that vector is going to have, you know, the 28 times 28 uh, number of x values. So you, um, and then, uh, you know, we're going to have, you know, some kind of classification. So, uh, you know, if we want to be able to tell the handwriting, let's say, 0 through 9, right, the, you know, the uh, digits. And we probably need to also have something that says, oh, it's none of above, right? So, so we have, you know, something like uh, uh, 10, uh, you know, output probabilities, and then maybe 11 for a, you know, none of above. So we have 28 times 28 times 11, you know, uh, elements in our matrix, right, in our matrix that we need to learn. So uh, when we can calculate the error function, and uh, essentially um, the error function, uh, we have a target value t, and then the, the net, network output function is going to be, you know, which category it belongs, right? And then the label is going to give us, you know, which, you know, what the, um, the, the you know, what, which the category it, it should belong. And then we can do a subtraction and say, okay, so that's the difference. And we can do a square and say, okay, uh, that's how we measure the error. And then, uh, you know what, we can, you know, uh, uh, do the error function. So this will be the error function for the y outcome that we generate, okay? So the, the final uh, outcome is y, and then the, the label is t. We subtract the, out, the output that we generate from what we're supposed to have and uh, do a square and uh, divide by 2. Then we get a mean square error of the, uh, of the error. So this is the error function we're going to try to minimize for across all the uh, input uh, pictures. Okay, so that's where we start in our uh, backward substitution. There are a couple of things that people use in the uh, in the machine learning world to be able to get uh, you know uh, some kind of a, you know uh, to to be able to get around these local minimal and so on. And these are the things that you really should take machine learning class to fully understand uh, those kind of techniques. So those are the things that we don't really teach here. We only use these terminologies because you know, we use their techniques. But um, you know, if you want to understand 
uh, why these techniques are determined, uh, you are designed those uh, in the way they did, you actually need to take the machine learning class. So uh, for each labeled image, okay, for each labeled image, um, we're going to uh, read the data to initialize the, uh, you know, the, the, the layer. So uh, we get one picture, and the picture says, oh, this picture should be, uh, let's say, number three, right, as a label. So we read the pixels and into, into the input layer, and then we evaluate the network and to get the y value, right? We get, we get that y value. And then uh, we compare that y value and see if it's number three. So if the network says, oh, uh, you know, it's really number two, then there's something wrong, okay? So, so we, we did, you know, the network is not set up properly. So we compare the, the y value with the output by doing the subtraction, square, and half to get the error value e. And then we back propagate the error derivative to get the parameter update. So we, we take that, we go back through the network, adjust all the weights, okay? Stage by stage by stage, doing the chain rule, okay, going back. And then eventually we adjust all the weights and then so that hopefully by the time we see this input again, the input will give us the correct output, okay? So uh, sometimes this is called supervised learning, right? So basically you punish the network enough and then uh, they get in shape, okay? And then so you, you, know, you, you, you twist each of these uh, weights uh, enough. And um, so the formal way of thinking about this, you have all these theta values in your system, all the weights and biases. So you take that huge vector and then um, you do a little bit of delta. The delta is what you're gonna be adjusting. You, need, you should be adjusting to the weights to get the exact value in the output, but you don't go all the way there because you don't want to overtrain. So you get a little uh, epsilon uh, multiplier to, to take a smaller step rather than a huge step so that uh, you can have you know, uh, a more stable numerical adjustment to your parameters. So this is, you know, this is really the universal, uh, what we call the conjugate gradient, uh, you know, the sort of approximation to our final result. At every stage in our, uh, in our training process, we have a theta vector, which represents all the weights and biases. And um, we calculate, uh, you know, what that delta needs to be and we multiply, uh, based on the chain rules, and then we multiply that value by a little epsilon to make a little adjustment to the weights, to all the eight weight elements, and hopefully with enough of these training data, with enough iterations, we will be able to get to the final uh, weight setting. So this is also the foundation for solving differential equations and so on uh, with what we call the iterative solvers. They do pretty much the same things, okay? Now, we have a few minutes, so hopefully we can work through this, um, you know, uh, you, and get you ready for, you know, uh, for sort of the, uh, thinking about the neural nets. So, um, we, we want to be able to uh, update uh, the weights, right? So we want to be able to, you know, see, this is the conceptual adjustment, all the weights and then uh, biases, and then, uh, so, uh, you concretely, we're going to try to see you know, how we can you know, um, uh, to add this uh, little bit value into, the, uh, you know, into the, uh, the weights to generate the next iteration, the weight for the next iteration in this iterative adjustment process. And then, uh, so if we look at the network, we have a, for any single perceptron uh, layer, okay, all connected perceptron layer, um, we, you know, this is what we have, right? Y equal to W times X plus B. So, you know, this is just that perceptual all connected layer. So the question is, how do we derive all those chain rule terms? Um, one thing that we can easily do is, you know, we can ask, how important is each weight to the output, right? So if we need to, you know, let's say, we want to be able to gen, uh, adjust the output. Why do I want to gen, uh, generate, uh, adjust my output? Because the final answer says I'm wrong. 
So I want to be able to adjust my output to contribute to the right answer, right? So I need to know, in order to make change to my y towards the correct direction, how fast should I adjust my w value? How much the adjustment do I need to make to each w element to be able to generate that, you know, to push the y value in the right direction? So we, what we do is we do a partial differen uh, differentiation of my output, of my output over my weights, right? The whole thing is about gener adjusting these weights. So if some of the weights have great influence on my output, I should ju adjust just a little bit. If some of the weights have very, very minuscule influence on my output, I should adjust more, right? So the amount that I'm going to adjust to each weight element depends on how important they are to the output, right? So if I do a partial derivative of my output based on each of my weight, right? This is a partial differentiation over every one of my weight elements. It turns out that the weight that uh, we're going, the, the importance of each weight is actually dependent on the particular input element that is going to be multiplied to that weight. This is very, very intuitive for this linear uh, expression, right? Because if you look at this, we have input value in the product with W. So th this is just pairwise multiplication of weight element, input element, weight element, input element. So how important each weight element is, is proportional to what? The value of the x value, the element value that you multiply to that weight, right? The bigger that x element is, the more effect this w value is going to have in the output, right? So this makes sense. So if I do a partial differentiation of y over w, okay, each element w, the outcome should be x. That tells you, you know, it's, it's the importance of w on that output, okay? w element on the output. So then we can, you know, we already said that the, out, uh, the error function is going to be y minus t squared square uh, divided by 2. So now we can calculate the dE dy in the final, out, out, uh, uh, final output. So the final output is, depends on y, and then uh, we do a uh, y differentiation, we get, you know, this is squared, so this is just a uh, chain rule again, uh, you know, the square function, so it becomes, 2 comes down, and then, uh, you know, y minus t, and then uh, this function, uh, y minus t itself becomes just 1, so you get a y minus t out over that differentiation, okay? Calculus, simple calculus, right? So, uh, so what is y minus t? Y, y is simply w times x, uh, you know, plus w. So uh, this is wx plus uh, b minus t. So this gives us the dE dy based on the inputs, okay, based on the input. We have dE dy based on the output, and then we can relay that into the input. So when we do a partial differentiation and say, hey, how important it is of each of my weight elements, each of my weight elements to the final error. Remember, that's the, the, the real objective. We want to make sure that we can adjust the W so that we can minimize that E, right? We can minimize the error. So we say, okay, so uh, we need to be able to calculate how important DE uh, you know, w is to the e, so we do a partial differentiation of e over w, right? And then for every w element value, for every w value, this is just a partial differentiation of e over y and y over w. And we already calculated this. y over w is just x, okay? And then dE dy is simply just wx plus e minus t. So we Place them all into this, and this gives us that little, you know, term that we're, we want to be able to, uh, to use to adjust the W value. And remember, 
we multiply this little thing here, that epsilon, okay, that epsilon here, to make sure that the, you know what, we don't do too much adjustment. So this gives us how we're going to adjust the W elements, the W elements in each of the, uh, in, uh, the W elements in that layer. So what do we do? We take the, w, the x value, okay, we take the x value of that will be multiplied to that W element, right? We take the x value, we do the, uh, you know, we multiply W with x plus B minus T, and then we do a little epsilon. This is, you know, determined statistically by the formula, and times the input x value, and we, we subtract the current W value by that little value, and then we generate the W I minus, uh, I, uh, uh, I plus one. Okay, yes? Ah, okay. So, so the question is, you know what, um, how do we actually reflect that value, right? We, when we generate that W value, uh, how do we, you know, the, uh, introduce that? Um, there are multiple ways of doing this, but you can, uh, you know, in general what you do is you can immediately reflect that, right, for the, uh, for the next evaluation. But there are also what we call mini-batching and so on. So uh, we're going to actually go over that, uh, you know, next time. Exactly, no. backwards, right? Okay, so uh, so the exam is going to cover up to this you know this lecture, right? And then uh, so for Thursday, we're going to hopefully you know uh, cover exactly what convolution network because conceptually it should be very very easy for you now to understand a convolutional neural network. Okay, I'll uh, see you on Thursday.